Good morning or good evening, depending on wherever you are. I am uh, uh, Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya and I am an Associate Professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Uh, uh, so, I, today I will be actually teaching you about uh, this very fantastic area of micro systems fabrication by using advanced uh, manufacturing process. Uh, so, to begin with, uh, I would just like to say a few uh, lines about what really microsystems are or how this uh, microsystems technology has emerged uh, over the years. So, if you look at this uh, particular slide, it kind of gives you a historical perspective of uh, microsystems uh, research and the way it evolved. And uh, here, uh, especially this highlighted region as you can see, talks about this uh, very famous lecture by Sir Richard Feynman uh, called There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Okay. So, it all started really from this particular lecture, uh, which incidentally was presented at uh, the annual meeting of the American Physical Society way far back in 1959. <coughs> so, at this time, uh, really uh, the, the, the research in the microsystems uh, engineering area was uh, fledgling or uh, at its fledgling stage. And uh, uh, there were some very interesting ideas which were pointed out by uh, Dr. Feynman about what can happen really when uh, one can go smaller and smaller. For example, uh, in one instance he really pointed out that if you can um, write the whole large play prayer in the, on the tip of a simple ballpoint uh, tip or ballpoint pin, uh, how small can the letters uh, be? And so, he talked at length about different scales and how they would look at uh, when you d really do miniaturize them. And some of the very fundamental concepts like scanning electron microscope, transmission electron microscope, etcetera, and the power of high energy beams have really emerged from this lecture. So, this uh, really followed one of the most rapid technological developments, uh, which is also known as the miniaturization of electronics and microelectronics as we call nowadays. And uh, there was this very famous law called Moore's law, which came into being from a business perspective, where uh, it was pointed out that this miniaturization density, if you look at every 18 months for a period of 18 months, would be uh, essentially doubling, which means that the amount of circuits that you can really print on to a small square area would go twice exactly with uh, the passage of about 18 months or so. Uh, so, this law really also tells you about how, uh, how uh, small uh, the, the miniaturization drive of electronics can take you to. It kind of gives you a time scale estimate for that. So, uh, this law when it started looked very good and you know people uh, really had about 18 months uh, time period for approximately doubling of the integration density. However, because of the limitations posed by photolithography processes, I am going to describe this in details a uh, little bit later what photolithography means really. So, uh, because of the limitations posed by this photolithographic process uh, of uh, being able to go uh, more than 100 nanometers or so, this law may eventually change to doubling uh, in every 24 months. And nowadays increasingly it has been seen that uh, instead of the 18 month period, the period of uh, integration density doubling itself has shifted to about 24 months or so. So, this is a sort of brief overview of where uh, the microsystems drive or microsystems revolution really started from. So, uh, you know because of this limitations posed by uh, the Moore's law to the business of the microelectronic uh, industry, uh, there were some processes really which uh, fell out because they were no longer uh, capable to handle the integration density which was offered by microelectronics. So, in the late 70s, um, these technologies were kind of gathered together and the silicon technology was extended to uh, what you call uh, machined mechanical micro devices or MEMS uh, as the term is known, microelectromechanical systems, uh, which came into being because of the fallout of the processes from the microelectronic industry. Okay. So, uh, this uh, field really was very exciting because uh, it had a component of mechanical uh, motion or mechanical synthesis of uh, small miniaturized 
structures or features, it also had a component of electronics where whatever signals it would be able to process can be transduced into corresponding electronic uh, signals. And then of course, uh, it, uh, it was uh, at the micro scale, so thus the name micro electro mechanical systems. So, as this field emerged, uh, microsystems technology increasingly ap uh, got applied to many fields like fluidic and optical uh, industry or components. And uh, these uh, sort of synergized with the MEMS technology and got integrated into this whole, uh, you know, micro devices. The concept of devices actually came up where variety of uh, techniques like fluidics, optical components. Uh, micro electronic systems, micro mechanical systems could be all integrated into one platform and together uh, these uh, so called micro devices were and the way that it was realized or built were known as the micro systems technology. So, our course really would focus uh, more on this micro systems technology and some of the very uh, state of the art processes of fabrication which should be used for realizing these systems as we would see in details uh, later on. So, let us look at a uh, little more of uh, historical perspective as to how uh, the MEMS or microelectromechanical systems really got integrated into uh, biological uh, or you know biomedical MEMS. So, uh, really when the MEMS started in the 1970s, uh, it was uh, dedicated uh, mostly to physical systems like realization of uh, temperature or measuring measurement of temperature, acceleration, velocity, so on and so forth. But uh, towards the late 1980s, uh, uh, there were increasing amount of uh, usages of this micro systems technology to realize uh, micro flow sensors, micro pumps, micro valves, where fluidic motion at the micro scale suddenly became very important. I would also like to point out uh, to this uh, one famous paper by Sir Andreas uh, Manns, uh, which was presented at a plenary lecture on miniaturized uh, total chemical analysis system, a novel concept for chemical sensing. And this was presented at the International Conference on Sensors and Actuators, which really changed the dimension for uh, these micro electromechanical systems and uh, slowly and increasingly uh, the field emerged into the biomedical uh, micro devices or biomedical MEMS systems. Uh, so, what these bio MEMS devices are or what they do really, uh, they are uh, uh, having uh, relatively uh, very high applicability to the field of uh, life science, biotechnology and medicine and of course, they are systems made up of very, very small micro to nanometer uh, size components and uh, this is because primarily these MEMS features scale very well with some of the biological entities uh, which are available. So, therefore, this uh, concept of MEMS which emerged from physical MEMS and went into biomedical MEMS really has uh, taken a lot of steps uh, and, and research has emerged in this particular area. So, this really shows why MEMS can be applied to the biological world and uh, this is one slide which mentions some uh, something about the sizes and the scales and the comparisons of the various MEMS devices with respect to the biological entities. So, here if you look really at towards this uh, left side of the scale, it starts from about 0 0.1 nanometers as you can see and it can go all the way to about 100 microns or so. And uh, just to uh, give you a few uh, examples on the size domain, 100 microns typically is the size of a human here. And uh, these entities here as you can see are uh, the biological entities which are very commonly available uh, in <coughs> different forms of life in the nature. For example, most plants and animal cells if you really look at the size domain <coughs> are about 10 micron plus uh, region. This is an illustration of a red blood cell, you know it is like a inverted button uh, from a shirt. It is a, a small sack which uh, contains various uh, chemicals and is, is a very good oxygen transporter within the human system. Uh, this for example, is uh, E. coli. Uh, it is uh, a small, you know, cylindrical 2 to 3 micron 
length about uh, 1 1.5 microns diameter object uh, and this is a bacteria and most of these bacteria are in the size range of about 1 micron to 10 microns. And uh, if you look at this particular species here, it is a virus, it is a capsid uh, made up of proteins with enclosing few uh, genetic information or materials and most of the viruses are in the 100 plus nanometer domain size range. If you go one step further, uh, this for example is, is, a, is a protein molecule and this here as you can illustrate here is a DNA, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid and one helical turn of the DNA is about uh, 2 to 3 nanometers, 20, 30 Armstrongs. So, you can think of that mother nature kind of builds uh, these systems up using a bottom of technology, assembling atoms and molecules in a particular fashion, so that you can generate these smaller entities, biological entities and these together would realize one of the very highest and complicated, most complicated forms uh, of life, you know, using bottom of fabrication technique. Uh, the, on the other side, on the right side, you can see some of these structures and features from the common micro systems domain. This for example, is a micro cantilever. You can see this lip sticking out of uh, <coughs> this structure and this whole pool here as you can see is a, is a sort of cavity into which this lip is sticking out. So, you can uh, recall this as a diving board in a swimming pool kind of structure. The only difference here is that because it is micro scale, this lip is about close to uh, about, about tens of microns and the thickness could be about 2 to 300 nanometers. And uh, the depth into which this cavity uh, is placed is can be close to about 1 to 2 microns. So, uh, the reason why I am illustrating all this is that uh, these some of these features and structures rhyme very well size wise with this biological entities. For example, this is again another uh, very interesting example, it is a polysilicon gate with nitride spacing and the minimum feature size of a MOS transistor uh, which has been declared by the ITRS roadmap in the year 2004 is less than 100 nanometers. And for such a, uh, such a, such a 100 nanometer device, the gate insulator re region uh, which may be this region is uh, as low as a few nanometers about 2, 3 nanometers or so. And so, you can see that even at the molecular level, there are these features and structures which are created which rhyme very well size wise with these molecules. So, uh, it gives you an opportunity to sort of uh, you know interact with the biological world more appropriately uh, by building micro size features and objects and therefore, the MEMS changed its direction mostly into biomedical MEMS and it had immense utility on some of the very interesting projects uh, developed by the human civilization like the human genome project so on so forth. And so, there was a huge class of uh, materials uh, called integrated biochips which got formulated and this is one of the major areas of MEMS uh, where some of these uh, components uh, could be microfluidics or could be with molecular specific sensors, could be MEMS and NEMS systems and molecular devices and memory structures etcetera. They got integrated into these 2D CMOS platforms and uh, they could do integrated sensing, detection, diagnostics very rapidly. So, therefore, uh, I have kind of illustrated or walked you through the history of these micro systems technology so called you know started in 1970s uh, f as a fallout of the microelectronic revolution and uh, then basically uh, went to realize some of the physical micro devices which could sense physical velocity acceleration uh, pressure so on so forth some physical parameters and then finally emerged into this biological micro systems or bio medical micro devices which could do sensing diagnostics very rapidly. So, it has been a very useful area uh, of research and work so far and what we will learn in this course really is how to make some of these micro systems devices using conventional or most of the time advanced machining processes or machining technologies. Let us look at some of the examples of physical MEMS as I uh, told uh, you before and these are some of the commercially available MEMS structures and devices uh, as on date in the industry. Uh, 
so, this uh, mostly is an area which is realized using silicon and uh, let us uh, see example 1 here, it is a bulk micro machined accelerometer and uh, this comes from a company called silicon microstructures and typically this, uh, this uh, uh, accelerometer is uh, having a basic principle as illustrated here, the concept of a proof mass. So, if you look at uh, this top left corner, we have uh, schematically shown how this accelerometer works. So, this proof mass here is uh, essentially a very small feature which can be uh, about 20s of microns by 50s of microns and uh, this is pivoted typically. So, if you look at uh, this domain cut. So, if you look at this uh, uh, proof mass and the way it is pivoted, uh, it is illustrated here by this uh, small cartoon, okay, which I am making for you in the screen. So, essentially this mass is pivoted uh, like this on a surface and uh, this surface here is actually uh, is inside a cavity or it is etched inside a uh, so cavity inside is etched and the remaining uh, part of the wafer is placed like this. Okay. So, you have a pivoted proof mass here by this uh, shaded region which is nothing as but this illustrated here and uh, you have a cavity here around <coughs> and uh, typically what happens is that there are uh, metal structures which are coming out from this proof mass on both sides. Okay. So, these are some of the metal structures which are coming out on both sides and can be illustrated here as 1, this one, okay, this one, 2 and this is again 3, uh, this 4 okay. and similarly there are other 4 indicated by these arrows here on the right side. So, these metal structures are coming out as you can see by the <coughs> vertical shaded lines on both sides. And then there are certain other metal structures which are actually present on the top of this surface uh, which has been micro machined and out of which the cavity has been made and these uh, structures are present in an interdigitated manner as you can see. So, you have one structure this one okay, present between component 3 and component 4. So, it is sort of interdigitated and it is placed in that manner. So, whenever there is a uh, movement of this particular MEMS housing, there is uh, a change in the angle of this proof mass here. So, the proof mass may actually uh, become something like this, okay. as you can illustrate and can be illustrated in this uh, diagram by the dotted line. And so, therefore, there is always a change in the interfacial area between these wings which are there on the mass, proof mass and the metal structures which are printed on to the otherwise plane surface. And because of the change in the interfacial area, there is always a change in the interfacial capacitance. Okay. And because of this capacitance change. Uh, there is a signal, there is an electronic signal. So, if I can <coughs> really uh, calibrate this, this capacitance change uh, with respect to the acceleration, roll, pitch, yaw, different uh, physical parameters, that is really what an accelerometer measures. These accelerometers are increasingly used nowadays in automobile sector for airbag based actuation and uh, in fact, uh, very small accelerations or decelerations can be recorded very easily using some of these structures. The advantage is that <laughs> this kind of an accelerometer would have a very uh, minuscule least count or uh, the accuracy of measurement would be higher because this proof mass may only be a few uh, maybe about nanograms or so in weight. Okay. So, it is a very small uh, amount of mass that you are really uh, carving out so that you can check 
physical parameters with great accuracy. Example 2 is uh, this very interesting uh, tool which is also the cornerstone of nanotechnology it is called an atomic force microscope or AFM. You can see here is a silicon structure uh, coming out uh, it is like cantilever and uh, the tip of this cantilever is atomically sharp. So, you can see this tip here it is uh, sharp to the size of a few atoms and this again is used uh, extensively for top topological measurements of surfaces uh, where this uh, cantilever tip is moved over a rough surface and uh, whatever crests and troughs are present on the surface are being monitored by means of the deflection by monitoring the deflection in the z direction of this particular cantilever. So, therefore, if suppose uh, uh, I were to monitor these uh, small valleys which are present over the surface, I would simply scan this cantilever on the top of these valleys and uh, wherever there is a valley and we, if we have some positive pressure onto the top of the cantilever, it would go and go into the valley and there would be a, a z direction displacement uh, in the negative z direction. And if we can record that, we can really take all such data points and reconstruct the image of the surface based, based on some of these points. So, an AFM can really be used in the uh, in the touching mode or the tap uh, tapping mode and uh, again silicon micro machining or micro manufacturing using some of these advanced manufacturing techniques are used for building some of these systems. So, along the course we might have an example problem where, where we might see how to develop or device these uh, AFM tips using uh, non-conventional or advanced manufacturing. Example 3 here is a very interesting uh, example, it is one of the commercially available uh, devices which are available uh, in the PowerPoint uh, in, 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 the, in the multimedia projectors. And this is something called uh, a digital micro mirror device chip from Texas Instruments. <coughs> so, let us look at the basic principle of how this uh, system works. So, uh, you can see here in this uh, particular figure uh, an array of plates which are shiny and they are probably made up of metal and they are very teeny tiny. So, therefore, it is actually a blown up uh, image and uh, each of these plates may be something like about a 6 micron into 6 micron. Okay. So, here this uh, dimension may be about 6 micrometers and similarly, uh, this dimension may also be another 6 micrometers. And each of these plates are arranged in an array format in a very complex manner as can be illustrated in this figure. So, these plates are really pivoted on both ends and they are like a simply supported uh, beam configuration and these plates also are electrically actuated from the bottom structure which is uh, indicated in blue here okay and they have these electrodes so if uh, there is an electric field <coughs> applied between this uh, blue base and uh, the bottom of this plate which is hanging uh, the plate deflects and because of the deflection uh, if this plate was shiny on the surface and if suppose light was falling onto this plate, uh, light would go out of focus. So, here for example, is the DMD chip which uh, actually is uh, carved out of this array of uh, different uh, uh, plates <coughs> and here for instance, if suppose this light beam falls in a certain direction from the focus, the optical focus and there is some pre-processing done like passing it through RGB filters and then optical choppers etcetera. And uh, let us say it were supposed to go in a direction uh, towards the focus or the focusing lens. So, typically if the plate gets deflected, the beam would go out of focus. And so, typically the pixel which was being represented by the plate which got deflected would close. So, you have a pixel close 
because of movement of the small mirror okay so uh, you may be able to realize that the image which is projected is really a function of such pixels it's an array of pixels so a pixel illustrated by a certain color or brightness or intensity would be representative of uh, creating some impression on uh, on on the surface which is corresponding to the image simultaneously a pixel which is closed or a pixel which is switched off would represent a dark region of the particular image so it is really a uh, an array of these pixels which would be able to demonstrate an image and you can do suitable amount of optical magnification uh, etc to this uh, particular image to transmit it and so if you have a signal in form of a zero or a one it can drive the angular deflection of several of these mirrors in unison uh, thus closing several pixels and opening several pixels and that can be used to translate the digital information of an image that is recorded in a computer onto the projector so it's one of the very fantastic examples of what mems structures can do in terms of image projection let's look at some of the other examples of uh, mems these are two uh, very interesting examples of silicon mems uh, again an accelerometer device uh, from analog devices uh, which is used uh, typically for the deployment of airbags as i was mentioning and uh, this is again a single chip microphone uh, which is again the principle is based on this vibrating membrane which is highly perforated as you can see on the bottom and you have a layer of uh, piezoelectric material coated on the top so whatever uh, you are speaking into this uh, small microphone uh, basically it resonates and vibrates this perforated membrane and it creates an electrical signal which can be processed or magnified and that's how you can hear sound uh, transmitted electronically over distances so typically all speaker based systems like telephones cell phones um, microphones etc are based on some of this miniaturized or super miniaturized uh, principles at work so that is uh, some of the examples uh, of silicon mems i would now like to also illustrate some other examples so let us now uh, see some more illustrations on applications of mems or microsystems in biology and uh, here uh, i have for you about six different illustrations of how microsystems can be really used in uh, uh, biology and uh, <coughs> as you can see here uh, the first uh, example uh, is very widely uh, referred to and read is basically this set of micro electrodes uh, which were developed at the university of michigan uh, by dr wise uh, wise's team actually so essentially this was used for monitoring the electrical activity of brain tissue and these electrodes here as you can see are printed and they are in plane and uh, this uh, needle here needle like structure here may be only a few tens of microns in width and a few hundreds of microns in length and uh, they are all printed with these so called uh, electronically uh, uh, placed or uh, for for electrical identification of signals uh, they are all coated metal prints or imprints uh, placed on the top of these electrodes <coughs> this again another is a very uh, this is again another very fascinating example from a uh, research group at stanford and this is uh, a neuroprobe and it is used for providing deep electrical stimulation to patients uh, suffering from parkinson's disease where uh, uh, these stimulations are medically advised sometimes for proper operations or or for for uh, you know the the sort of uh, uh, routinizing of functionalities uh, of any human being suffering from these uh, these uh, diseases 
So again, a very fantastic example of micro systems at work, uh, slender like tall needles which may be about uh, 20 to 30 microns in width wise and few hundred microns tall uh, and uh, these, these are quite uh, uh, excellent examples of microsystems in biology. <clears throat> this is another example of what microsystems can do for monitoring the crosstalk between neurons. Uh, these are some neuron cells growing over an array of MOSFETs and this area is also known as nanobiology and it has recently come out uh, very well. Um, sometimes uh, physiological monitoring of cells using this uh, signals, these electronic signals uh, becomes very critical to understanding their crosstalks. Uh, so, essentially the idea is that these neurons are growing over the, uh, the gate region of these MOS transistor arrays and uh, if there is a change in the, uh, the surface protein expression of these cells, it is recorded in terms of change of surface potential. And so, if you can keep on monitoring the current based on the change in surface potential, it can give you an idea of what crosstalk is going on a single cell level between many cells growing together on the top of this array. <coughs> example 4 here is uh, again a very interesting and very fa fascinating example of uh, MEMS in biology. This is a micro needle okay? and this is based on uh, the, the sting or the needle of a mosquito. So, when a mosquito bites you, you hardly feel the pain uh, because uh, the needle is not able to really damage or deflect the pain receptors which are placed underneath the, the human skin. So, uh, of course, there is a swelling which uh, comes, but that swelling is more because of an enzyme that it releases uh, so that uh, it can thin out the blood samples that it is taking. Uh, but otherwise, this these needles are about 20 microns and again about 180 or 200 microns in length, 20 microns in diameter. So, it is a high aspect ratio slender structure and uh, such uh, structures if we can fabricate uh, as arrays or groups uh, and fabricate it over let us say pads which can be mounted on uh, the fingers or different regions of the body. You can think of or envision a system of painless drug delivery uh, to the human body. So, uh, in fact, uh, this uh, slide has been borrowed or this uh, picture has been borrowed from this company called Cometrix, which uh, commercialized uh, some of these micro needles technologies for drug delivery applications. <coughs> this again is an example of uh, uh, a very fascinating area of microsystems called uh, integrated biochips and sensors. And now, uh, this area also got uh, into picture because of the need dictated by the human genome project again, where analysis of samples became very critical at a very rapid pace or fast pace. So, typically these biochips, integrated biochips are uh, made up of uh, uh, some channels and chambers and architectures which can handle minuscule amount of volumes of fluids of a certain target and uh, they can be mixed in proportions, different proportions with their analytes of interest so that they can be recognized. So, there is some kind of a transduction of signal which uh, changes the chemical information onto the, the analyte of interest into an electrical signal or an optical signal and uh, the whole integration of how to change the signal or how to process the signal or how to infer from the signal is uh, done together on this integrated biochip. So, these technologies or this group of technologies are also known as lab on chip kind of technologies and they are very useful uh, for the diagnostics, the clinical diagnostics world. <coughs> again, a very fascinating application of MEMS. Uh, again, uh, uh, this example 6 here illustrates uh, a bunch of different cantilevers and I have already mentioned about these cantilevers extensively while talking about AFM and uh, the technology of AFM. So, these cantilevers can be very easily used for recognizing DNA molecules. In fact, this work uh, 
done for the first time at IBM Zurich Research indicated that deflection on these cantilevers can uh, be synergistic with some of the binding events that may happen onto the top of these cantilevers uh, between capture probes which are very intelligently placed on the top of each cantilever and a target molecule which may come and bind. And so, this deflection uh, can be recorded uh, with certainty uh, 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 to indicate whether there is a binding action which has happened and uh, this can be used for uh, typically for applications like DNA microarrays etcetera. So, this is again another very fantastic example of microsystems in biology and its applications. So, if we really look at a bunch of these different technologies uh, sort of micro and nano systems and the way that they apply to the, <coughs> the biological world. Uh, so, I would uh, try to classify these technologies uh, as ones which have a biological impact or are bio inspired and uh, it is a synergistic learning process where uh, on the uh, on the left side uh, these three boxes are representative of uh, learning experiences from micro nano systems which would result in some novel solutions uh, for frontiers in medicine and biology and uh, uh, these can uh, use examples like diagnostics uh, we have discussed about biochips there can be uh, nano microstructures like quantum dots, silicon nanowires, carbon nanotubes, so on and so forth. There can be some therapeutic applications like targeted drug delivery, painless uh, drug delivery or drug release systems. Again, uh, where micro nano systems can be used uh, for some, for de developing some solutions uh, or frontiers in medicine and biology. And then you have these hybrid bio devices where you can develop uh, through tissue engineering a complete organ, but again keeping the principles of micro uh, nano fabrication or you know advanced uh, manufacturing of such processes as applied to biology and medicine. Okay. The, the boxes on the right here are illustrative of a reverse learning experience which you get through what biology and medicine has to offer and how you can apply on to some systems which would be useful for developing micro nanotechnologies. For example, let us consider self assembly uh, which can be DNA protein mediated or you know uh, mediated with SAMs or self assembled monolayers. Again something which uh, is naturally available and uh, you can directly apply this uh, to do uh, some very novel work of maybe nano scale interconnects or micro scale interconnects which can be a part also of molecular electronics or single molecules or DNA can be used as a basis of conducting wires, nano wires between more than two uh, posts. Uh, there is another very fantastic example of uh, developing these bio inspired materials like for example, the human skin. Okay. So, if you look at the skin, it is such a wonderful instrument, it can self heal, it can respond, it can repair, uh, it can sense. and. Uh, uh, learning from what mother nature has to offer in terms of the scheme and trying to uh, enumerate the fabrication technology, so that you can develop these advanced machining processes is another way of looking uh, to develop these novel solutions or frontiers in materials or information processing. So, therefore, it is a synergistic learning experience on the left you have learning from micro nano systems as applied to the biological world and on the right you have uh, learning from biological world as applied to micro nanotechnology systems.